Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, welcome to our panel, Why We Care, How Entrepreneurs Are Adding Economic and Social Value to Africa. My name is Liz Malone. I'm the a program manager for the Nelson Center for Entrepreneurship. We're really excited to welcome our panelists from all over. Um, so a little backstory: um, Abby Rubin, our awesome admin coordinator, you want to raise your hand, just wave to everyone. <laughs> um, her second week in, she met with one of our PhD students, Philip Alibi, 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 and um, he's the founder of a nonprofit that um, brings university textbooks to post-secondary schools in Africa, and he had the idea for this event. And so we were really excited to hear um, of the stories he wanted to bring to campus. And so like most events that we have are student driven. So if you ever have an idea for an event, come see Abby or myself. Um, but we're really excited to introduce um, our panelists today and our moderator. Um, also, I want to make a side note that CHE, which is a uh, Brown University startup, um, and uh, students from African countries that have started this company will be serving CHE, which is a snack. Um, in the um, foyer um, after the panel. Awesome, so I'm excited to introduce Dr. Vibha Pingal. Um, she's a class of 96. She is a, the president and founder of Ubuntu at Work. She's also an adjunct lecturer, lecturer at Brown University, and she's spoken several times um, at the center, and she teaches an amazing class that you should all check out in CAB. Um, next, Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Darko, founder of Africa Potential. Um, Dr. David, oh wait, no, sorry, I'm done here. Uh, Damilo Junaid, uh, she, uh, she is her MBA. She's the founder of the Arise African FDN. Um, next, sorry, that's a little different on this panel. Uh, let's see. Emmanuel. Emmanuel, sorry. <laughs> Emmanuel Name, uh, co founder of Educom World. Next. <laughs> um, Sorry, Dr. Tunde Alawude, co-founder of Dot .learn. Um, next, uh, Dr. David Bakuli, professor of management. And uh, last, Tayo Roxon, uh, CEO of UID Management. And we have amazing co-sponsors of this event. Um, you'll see them all listed up um, on the, uh, behind me, <laughs> oh, right here, behind me. So. There's a lot of folks that were involved in making this event happen, and I just wanted to do a shout out to them and thank them for supporting this event. And I'm just gonna kick it off now to yeah. Viva. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. This is on. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, it's the first, the inaugural panel at the Nelson Entrepreneurship Center on African Entrepreneurs. So we are very excited and welcome to all of you at To Brown. Um, so, as we get started, I think the first thing to do is ask you all to describe and to tell us about your nonprofits or your for profits and to introduce the work that you're doing. So, my name is Dan Dako. I am the founding president for Africa Potential. Africa Potential is a nonprofit that is devoted mainly for education in various African countries. Initially, our focus was to help young women who could not get high school education to be able to have high school education. As some of you may already know, in, on the continent of Africa, sometimes we have, uh, in, in, as you say, in most of our countries, we have boarding schools for high school. And when parents have more children and they have limited resources, they are more likely to fund the boys to go to secondary schools and finish high school and move on to university. And so Africa Potential's primary focus initially was to help young women, young girls, wherever we can find them, to be able to sponsor them to be able to have high school education. As I speak now, we are in multiple countries. We are probably working specifically on that front about, in about five countries now. The other things we do is to train leaders in the university level to be able to manage basic things and what we call marketplace leadership training to be able to help Africans in universities to think about different leadership styles, different management styles to be able to make impact in their communities. Uh, as of today, I could uh, tell you that my, with my board members, we are involved in Uganda, Kenya, 
Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Ghana, and what I like to describe generally as Arab North Africa, where much of our interest is with young women for graduate level education. As our motto goes, we are committed to empowering Africans in Africa for a better Africa. And that describes pretty much what Africa Potential does. Thank you. Thank you, Dami. Hi, everyone. It's working. Good. Um, so I'm the founder of the Arise Africa Foundation. And what we do at Arise, uh, the mission is to increase the number of Nigerians that get tested and treated for sexually transmitted diseases um, annually. Um, and the mission sort of was driven from a lot of factors, but the major one is knowing that Nigeria being the giant of Africa, we have the second highest number of individuals living with HIV AIDS annually, um, well, globally. Um, and we think that's a problem. So we, we try to solve that problem in three ways. So we do that through education, um, leveraging the power of the media, and also providing means for people to get tested and treated. So education aspect, we target young people specifically. But as we're targeting young people, we also draw audiences from um, other demographics that we don't think about as well. We target them on social media because they're all on social media. A majority of people are on social media right now. Um, so we leverage the power of um, social media to instigate change, celebrities as well, influencers, because a lot of young people follow them and pay attention to them. Um, we also provide a means for people to get tested and treated, because it's one thing to educate people about sexually transmitted diseases. It's another thing for them to actually have the resources to get tested. So we make sure that we, we right now we're focusing on creating a database of hospitals and clinics that people can actually go and get tested. So when people reach out to us and ask where the nearest clinic is to their location, we have that database compiled. It's still being built right now because it's not complete. But the whole idea is to make sure that it meets our standard in terms of confidentiality because stigmatization is still very prevalent in Nigeria and in most African countries. Um, we also make sure that the quality um, of the testing is maintained. We make sure that the treatments are actually there. Um, people don't want to find out they have an STD that doesn't have a cure. Um, so that's basically what we do, education, media, and testing and treatment. Hi, my name is Emmanuel Nyame from Ghana. I run Educom World, which is a nonprofit focused on using education to empower young people around the world, making them realize the potential they have and how they can improve upon that potential to kind of um, make, make the world a better place. We believe that everybody has unique talents and capabilities, but then we usually find it difficult to locate these um, talents and it's not just about locating or uh, discovering it, but then how do you move from the talent um, st stage to actually um, making impact with whatever you have been endowed with? So we focus on developing these skills, making sure people after college are able to um, know their calling, are able to know what they really want to do, and then provide opportunities, programs, and um, sessions to help develop them. I'm also involved with Social Good Ghana, which is like um, a program with the United Nations Foundation. And what we do is to um, organize activations online and physical events to um, shed more light and promote the sustainable development goals. We've been doing this for the past two years in partnership with the United Nations Foundation, and we have made successful impact in Ghana. So I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to, co to be contributing to everything which is going to happen today. And I, w I really want to thank the organizers and everybody for putting this together. And I'm grateful. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tonella O'Day, uh, co-founder of Deathline. What we do um, is to make it possible for students anywhere to access online learning. Um, irrespective of whether or not they have a good connection. Um, so if you live in Lagos or in Kenya or in India, you know that internet is not easy to, get to come by. Um, you have access to 2G connection that is very, very poor, and that connection is very, very expensive. So how do you access a free resource like Khan Academy, right? Uh, so what we do um, is to, what we've done is to develop um, an algorithm that reduces the file sizes of these videos by up to 100 times. So what that means is that you can have 
um, five hours of video um, for about the cost of sending a single text message. Um, and we've been rolling out in uh, Ghana and Nigeria so far, and now we'll be working with um, education companies that want to um, reach their users. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Bakuli, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, I do have several projects that I can talk about, uh, but uh, a number of them are private, uh, family-owned, and I think the, the idea uh, that maybe uh, what will be of benefit to most people here is how you can manage that projects in Africa when you are here. I'm from Kenya, and I do manage them while, uh, while operating here. Uh, the other part is also a, a story of how uh, my, my major focus has been in the transfer of technology. And so later on, we might talk about how we, are, we were involved in transferring technology from here at the beginning stages of the internet. And I was part of the group that created Africa Online. For those who are in Ghana, uh, Ivory Coast, Zimbabwe, and Kenya, that's where we, we, we operated. We are the, the premier internet service provider on the continent. Uh, recent, the most recent one was in, in, in the, is what we are forming. It's a, a microfinance. And this one has come out of a WhatsApp group. So we started the WhatsApp group during campaign in Kenya in 2016. So we were meeting. We created a, a platform that was neutral so that people from a particular constituency in Western Kenya would come and give us the ideas they have about the project. We were not affiliated to any party. And at the end of the, the elections, we have now converted that into uh, a savings uh, an investment group. And the reason being that uh, even th there's a particular constituency in this uh, county, it has uh, 250,000, uh, population 250,000. There are two sugarcane factories there, and they pay out every week on Friday about $100,000 equivalent. But there is no single bank within this constituency. It's uh, 66 square miles. Uh, area. So the farmers have to go outside to get this money and obviously they spend the money outside. So what we have seen, there is an opportunity for us to create a micro bank, a micro finance institution, perhaps a community bank, and that's what we are forming. We are just in the stage of uh, registration now. So that and that are real estate projects we might talk about. Thank you. Tayo. Thank you. Um, is this on? Um, Hi everybody, uh, Ty Roxon. I'm from Nigeria, Lagos, and uh, also like to echo the sentiments of my fellow panelists here. I'm really honored to be here and uh, grateful for the opportunity. My company is called UID Management, and it's based on my mission statement, which is use your difference to make a difference. And we focus in, on three things, uh, education, media, and youth representation. And on the education side, a lot of our work is going into companies to help them figure out the importance of what diversity truly brings, you know, people from immigrant backgrounds like me, or people from people of color, and people that are, um, you know, women and people that have been previously underrepresented. So we go into companies and we consult, we speak, and then we um, work with them on that. On the media side, which is actually what launched my career, you know, I, I have a podcast as well as other, other platforms where we tell stories that aren't being told. You know, um, and Emmanuel was actually one of my first guests. Emmanuel was seeing the, the beginning of this, but uh, when, whenever I was starting out the, the, uh, the podcast, um, he was one of the people who agreed to jump on and talk about what he was doing in Ghana. So there's that element. Um, and um, occasionally I might be on, on some shows which sort of represent what Africans and diaspora do. And then on the um, youth development side, that's a big passion of mine. Uh, I come from Nigeria. Over half the population is, is um, you know, 35 and under, and we're approaching 200 million in terms of our population. That also is very similar for the rest of Africa. And then there's this huge um, concern about whether, you know, you're employable, are you you know, giving them the skills, or do we have the opportunities? So a lot of my work is focused on job creation and uh, making sure that people are ready to uh, acquire those jobs. So um, that's a short version. Uh, but um, thank you all, and uh, looking forward to the panel. Thank you all. Um, you know, many of you have uh, social enterprises, 
and many of you also have for-profits. So I'd love to hear from you how you see the for-profit versus non-profit divide, the social enterprise versus for-profit enterprise divide, and why you chose to start one rather than the other, why you chose to start a social enterprise rather than use, uh, have a for-profit that had the same social impact. So your thoughts. And uh, Tayo, do you want to start first, okay. this in reverse order of the uh, Okay, I guess for me, I don't necessarily see a distinction. I think whenever I think of social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, I think you're solving a problem. And a lot of the, the things that we try to address with, with um, Africa, whether, like I said earlier, is the, the employability issue, the providing for opportunities, it involves infrastructure, it involves health care, it involves, you know, things that like education and dealing with, with um, you know, internet and, and electricity. So those things for-profit do, those things social enterprises do. So whether we're combating and reducing malaria or HIV, any of that, yes, it's a social enterprise, but it's also in service of making sure we have more people who live long enough to have these opportunities. And so for me, I just approach it from a, a gen, uh, an approach of trying to solve a problem. Um, second largest continent, largest potential, GDP is, is exponential, so I, I don't want a, a situation where a lot of kids go up into a place where they don't have people for them or there's a lack, there's a gap in the middle management and then, you know, leads them to sort of think of other options. Um, and I personally grew up in two military dictatorships, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's sort of seen that and I don't want that cycle to be what our generation um, experiences, so. David, what do you think? For profit versus non-profit, how do you see it? My sentiments are similar to his. I don't see much difference. In fact, when I was looking at that uh, question, um, and then you compare the process of creating either a social entrepreneurship or, or for-profit entrepreneurship, I don't find much difference. For example, both of them will require you for, to recognize an opportunity. So the difference might be this is an economic opportunity, this is a social economic uh, opportunity. Uh, they also, you also need to develop that concept after you have recognized the concept. You need to determine what resources you need and you acquire, you acquire those resources. You need to launch and think of ideas of how, whether you're going to grow, how you're going to, to manage that or be just a single entity. Uh, then you have goals. When will I attain these goals? What goals do I have? And so forth. So both for-profit and social entrepreneurship will have that. The major difference I see in terms of, uh, uh, for example, goal attainment if you are for profit, you may want to continue. I don't think you're going to, you are going to disband. Mm -hmm. But if you are a social entrepreneur, you might reach a point to say, I've solved the problem. Mm -hmm. This was perhaps pregnancy, or this was uh, uh, people with certain sicknesses. I've solved that, and I can move on something else in which you re 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 uh, So would back. you say that being a, a social enterprise gives you more flexibility? Gives flexibility, but I would want to be in both because I've, I've found even a uh, for some projects where I've been volunteering as a, you know, in social, those social entrepreneurship projects, I need the money from the other side. Mm -hmm. So I'll convince the for-profit, can you contribute? So, and if I have a for-profit, for I'll use some of the profits there and put in, especially if you have tax laws that will allow deductions and so okay. on. Okay. Yeah. Tunde? Uh, so I've started a non-profit and I still run it. Um, so what we basically do is to um, try to change the education system in Nigeria through um, trying to challenge students to develop um, solutions to local problems. And I spend, for all the time I spend on that project, about half of it is spent on fundraising. Um, going, writing uh, grant applications or going to beg people, begging my friends, trying to do a GoFundMe, and it's not fun. Um, and I never saw it possible for me to ever work there full time, to get my resources to it, my time to it, um, which is why I started to look at doing something that could be self-sustainable. And when we started Dove Learn, the conversations that I've had have been quite different. I think that even though um, there are some things that I think just can't be for profit, but I think that things that might in any way, um, if, if there's a way to structure anything in a for-profit way, then it should be done. Um, because you want to reach as many people as possible. You want there to be a market-based reason for someone to get access to what you're trying to 
push out there, right? Um, so I don't see a divide in the sense of, you know, you have to choose one or the other. I think that the best way to make an impact is to build a company that can make that impact. I think the best, most impactful company that I know in Nigeria right now um, are the banks and the telcos. And we build, even, even the, the, the non-profits build stuff on top of those, um, it's what those uh, folks have already built, right? So I don't see it as a different thing that, um, you know, of course, if, 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 uh, if, if, I want, if you want to keep chasing money every time, um, you're welcome to do so, but I think that if you can, figure out a way to make that thing make money, even if you don't want to pay yourself for it, but for that, for that idea to not die, the best, best way to do it is to go for the for-profit route. So the primary, so the primary uh, factor, you'd say, was sort of uh, whether or not it became sustainable and whether or not you spent, how much time you spent fundraising. Um, yes, so in, in my company, I can pay myself and I can walk up to an investor and tell them, I want to raise half a million dollars. I can't do that, I can't s say the same thing if I'm trying to um, solve water crisis. Maybe I can if I'm, um, um, some and some actor, um, but I'm not. So, Emmanuel. Thank you. All right. So personally, I started out um, way back high school, Accra Academy, as um, a, a, a student participant in a program called Junior Achievement, mm -hmm. where we started out um, running companies on campus, and what we did was to provide. I mean, soft loans for students, when you're going back home, we give them like, like $20, and then they, I mean, when school resumes, they pay back uh, um, with 25% interest. Mm -hmm. So then we started out as a for-profit company, and we made a lot of money. We were able to float shares. We got students, teachers, even interested in buying shares in the company. So that's how we started, and it went so well. But then moving forward, I feel like sometimes we need to look around and realize that it's not always about the money. There are so many people who need help, who are in trouble, who are in need of something that we can be able to easily provide. We don't have to wait till we are sick before we realize that there are a lot of problems with the health sectors around the world. We don't have to wait till there is a climate issue before we realize that we need to focus on climate. So everything I do is centered around making sure that the world becomes a better place through social enterprise. Because even if, if, if you take a closer look at the sustainable development goals, there are so many issues around those 17 goals that we can be able to provide or, or run a service in order to reduce the effect of some of these problems. We, we really have to rise up to um, the point where we are making money. Mm -hmm. It's okay, right? But then we also need to realize that there are so many problems that a, a lot of people are facing and we can be able to start um, social enterprises to address these problems. So personally, yeah, the money is there, you're making money, but then you should have that kind of um, eye for, you know, social issues around the world. That is me. That, um, so David felt that having a social enterprise sort of gave you more flexibility. Would you agree with that? Well, both, because flexibility, I think, revolves around what you're passionate about. I feel like if you really want to achieve flexibility in whatever you're doing, and you're not passionate about what you're doing, it becomes difficult. When the passion is there, it becomes so easy because you don't have to work a lot, you know? You don't have to work a lot to, to do what you're doing. So flexibility to a larger extent um, means that you have to be passionate about what you're doing. And okay. yeah, I think that's what has helped me over the years because it's, it's, it's been passion all the time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Dami? Um, so I would um, echo the same sentiments as everyone on the panel. Um, I feel social enterprises and for profit enterprises are also, um, they're, all, they're all solving a need, whatever format you see that. Um, for me personally, why I started a social enterprise as opposed to um, a business. It has to do with my background. I wanted to go to medical school from day one. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. It's healthcare, healthcare, healthcare. Um, and also seeing the disparities in healthcare access to resources. It's not very 
if you compare it to the Western world, what you have in Nigeria and things that can be easily prevented, you don't have that um, in developing countries. So being exposed to issues like that, it just makes your heart bleed. It's very hard to overlook that and just be so focused on the money. Um, so it, it's a thing of do you appreciate, like appreciating where you're coming from and where you're at and um, being able to see that like everyone has said. Um, and also in terms of like businesses, for example, I, I think it's very essential. Um, I went to business school for a reason. Um, even though my background is in healthcare, I eventually went to business school, particularly because as a nonprofit, you can't sustain yourself. Um, so you do, re you, you need that sustainability, you need that finance, um, that financial in um, contribution to be able to keep doing what you're doing. Um, so I, I do, I appreciate when businesses have corporate social responsibilities and try to give back, because um, that's basically essential. But at the same time, you can't really do a lot of things if you don't have the infrastructures in place. Um, when people are in need at some point, like when you're, like in developing countries, for example, like having to clear a piece of land just so you can build your own factory or whatever, um, that's displacing a lot of lives, for example. But um, in situations whereby young people, for example, have to you know, get into crime because people are not taking care of them, the education is not there, um, they don't have jobs, eventually even the rich people get affected as a result of it. So like everybody has said, I feel everybody has, we all have a role to play. Um, you can make money to some extent, but at some point you're gonna be inconvenienced by those who, um, are, are, those who are in need because there's that imbalance and society would tend towards, like we, there's no balance, people would like, violence would occur, a lot of things would go wrong. Um, so yeah, that's my take on it. They're both great, we just kind of have to balance it out, I guess. Yeah, for me, the, when it comes to Africa Potential, Africa Potential for me is my give back project. I'm a full-time professor at the college. And so starting nonprofit is a give back project on the question of social or entrepreneurship. For what we do in Africa Potential, they seem to go together in many ways. I'll give you an example. I was raised by a mother who was 100% illiterate, ran textiles business in Ghana, and did well, but could have done way, way better if she was educated. And so part of what we do in Africa Potential is basically giving people sometimes the education they need, the technical know-how they need to be able to run their own entrepreneurial ventures. We have small scale businesses, uh, startups that we find in our countries. Uh, in Nigeria, we find it in the South, more so with the Igbos. Uh, in Ghana, you have the Kwaus. And even if you are in the city, you see people starting something. Africa Potential targets some of these people, give them basic bookkeeping skills, planning skills, strategizing, something that we could not have done if it were for profit. Because they would have to pay to be there. But with us sponsoring such projects, they're able to acquire the skills they need to be able to run their own uh, startups and thrive. So I, I think if we were in this contest and we we're thinking about it, I would say, of course, I could see the freedom with social entrepreneurship. Uh, but in that contest, I take my village in Ghana, for example, it's not a matter of choice. If I want to help the people get empowered, I need to bring my brother who is trained in management and accounting and twist his arms to offer some free training. I need to bring somebody else to offer some free training. After that, I could be prepared to give some people some small money here and there and say, go on so that as the years go by, I can check on them and see them do well. So I see that mutual support. And I guess if I want freedom, I will settle on social entrepreneurship and not let my college ask me to follow all these things I need to do. But sometimes we need entrepreneurship to make the world go, to get the support we need for Africa potential to be able to help other people. Okay. Um, do any of you have a comment on what someone else said on the panel? 
Kyle? Yes, uh, I have yeah. a comment, sorry. Yeah. No, please go. No, please yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Tam said something that uh, actually I had looked at before when she talked about uh, corporate social responsibility. And I found that the companies in Kenya would claim they are engaging in corporate social responsibility by giving back to the community. However, there was, it was lopsided in the mm -hmm. sense that you own, if, if they were in Nairobi, then you weren't support, supporting entities that are projects that are in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So it left out the rural people out, not, not, mm -hmm. uh, not helped. Another shortcoming was that they would don't, a majority of them would focus on sports, Kenya being a sports country, so they only start supporting uh, you know, events that are do with sport but don't uh, spread it out. So perhaps is, may, if people have got ideas of what, how they can create a portfolio of CR so the, projects yeah. and then have companies sign up that way. And then also spread out to other areas that don't have corporations in there. Right, so the expand the social impact of entrepreneurs. Yeah, beyond this. Beyond, The okay. urban centers. Kyle or? Oh, sure. Um, I mean, uh, just a few things. I mean, for me, my first influence with this was, uh, you know, the late Nelson Mandela. Like, you know, I was one to nine and a half. Babangida and Abacha, those were the two people mm -hmm. I knew. Military dictatorships, um, if, if you don't. And that's kind of what I saw. So a lot of, you know, curfew, muslin of the press, you know, all those type of things. My family was particularly affected with that. And, um, and I remember seeing Nelson Mandela, and at the same time, he was fighting for you know, for South Africa, apartheid. And that to me was an image of someone I could be. It's why I'm in the field of representation, diversity, and inclusion today. And so to everybody's point, whether it's social entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, it's the idea that each one of us here represent the continent. And if anyone, a small kid, a young guy, a young lady, sees success in someone that looks like them, that is, 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 a, is a physical representation of what they could do that means that you have a chance in the, in the kid's mind. And that, that straddles entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship. And that, that to me goes to Manuel's points of passion and what you're doing. Ultimately, ideally, whether you're making money or you're providing opportunities for low-income people, if someone says, I can be the next this, the next that, that's what I'm trying to do. That's why I'm particularly with this. So that's, that, that was the only thing I had to add to that. Okay. Presentation. So. Okay. I just want to clarify um, what I said before. Um, I, str I feel strongly that uh, I th I'd like to challenge everybody here. Um, if you're trying to build anything, think about how to make it for profit. I do strongly believe that. Um, so if you're trying to, um, so in Nigeria, uh, where I'm from, there are people that have been in jail for five, 10 years without charge because the justice system is just so slow, right? There is probably no way to build a for profit around that, right? You have to basically go pro bono and get people out, right? Um, but there are a lot of things that we might see as, oh, we have to do non-profit. So, you know, it's something that is either too sensitive, too expensive, or whatever. Um, in Nigeria, still, there is a, a company that is making it possible for you to get blood um, if you're sick, if, uh, you're, if the hospital needs blood. Right, so do you, everybody, all the people that have tried to do this, so the nonprofits, the governments, it's all just dysfunctional, right? Um, and two years ago, a company called LifeBank um, startup um, that makes it possible for you to reliably get blood in your hospital, for you to be able to save lives. That company will save more lives than the government can if it's controlling the blood supply, right? I can give many, many examples like that, right? Um, the, the, in agriculture, a one acre fund in, um, in East Africa is, you know, the governments have, uh, nonprofits have ways of giving loans to farmers. One acre fund is way more efficient than governments, right? They're not, they're not making the, a lot of money. They just, they try to just break even. Um, in in uh, Ghana, there is a farmer line, I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with them, uh, making it possible for farmers to get information but in a for profit manner, and the bigger they grow, their growth relies on them making impact. The more farmers are able to reach, the more farmers are able to get information, the better for them. So they have an incentive to actually put in their resources, hire the best people, get the best minds, get the best processes to make it happen. There's a, a company in Nigeria called Farm Crowdy um, that makes it possible for individuals to invest in farms, right? So they, they go to a bunch of farmers and tell them, 
you know, what do you want to grow? You want to grow bananas. Do you have money? No, you don't have money. They put that online and people can go invest in that. And take a cut. I could say I want to start a nonprofit tomorrow to just, you know, give, uh, I don't know, a thousand dollars for free. But I can't do as much as those guys can do, right? And I could give a lot of examples in other sectors. In education, there is uh, Bridge International. They've reached a million students. I don't know how many um, nonprofits can. My nonprofit in education has reached maybe a thousand, right? So it is possible. I, I think that it's hard to try to build something sustainable around um, a business in poor environments, but it is possible if you think about it. So I just want to add up to what my colleague said. Um, yes, it's true, you have to think about sustainability for your business, whether it's a pro, uh, for profit or non profit. But I think that you also have to think about one thing that there are people who started for profit companies and after a couple of years made so many, I mean, so much like millions or billions of dollars and then they collapsed eventually. At the same time, people started non-profits. I mean, they made huge impacts. They had all the grants, funding, whatever. But then after some time, they also collapsed. So the underlying factor is whether you want to start a for-profit company or non-profit company, you need to think about one thing, which is your attitude towards progress. We are all here definitely because we want to hear something or learn something about entrepreneurship, how we can all start a company, sustain it, you know, make money and all of that. But we also have to realize that it involves a lot of work. It involves a lot of sacrifice. It involves a lot of things. You know, it, nobody just succeeds overnight. I mean, you. I mean, there's the need for people to realize that. Fine, there are so many ways to make money. There are so many ways to impact people in society, um, anywhere in the world. But you also need to think about our attitude towards progress, our attitude towards work. I I, I want to create an environment where anytime. We are speaking anytime we have like a conversation like this or anytime we're doing work or whatever it is, we are moving forward. We are not doing what has been done before. We are doing something unique which can be able to impact society. So I, I just wanted to add up to what, what he said. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You, um, any other <laughs> okay. So, so. No, it was this, I was thinking the same thing because I, I, it, it really, the one thing I will agree is that if we're going to achieve progress in Africa, it's the private sector. But the private sector includes for-profit and non, and because the idea of, of money and all that, I, I get it, but it's, it really is about the impact. I can't tell you how many kids or people I come across who say, I felt seen, heard just because of that message, and that, that sparked something. We can't underestimate the power of imagination. And it's one of the most powerful things. I know you got other questions. I'm okay. stopping now. Okay. But let's go. Thank you, Tayo. <laughs> okay, so, so for all the aspiring social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in the audience, um, what are, were the most surprising or unexpected challenges you faced as you guys got started with your enterprises, whether social or for profit? What, 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 I mean, we all expect the certain challenges when we start an enterprise or a social enterprise. What was unexpected? Do you want to start? Yeah. Sure, for me, first I realized that I started Africa Potential because I saw a need and I think that is what we all mm -hmm. share here. We see a need and we tell ourselves we will not sit back, we want to do something about it. And then you start. I was too ambitious in the beginning <laughs> about how much I can raise. Um, I was also too ambitious about how much support I could have on the ground. Because our model is we have to work with Africans who can mentor and deal with the people we are working with. And I assume that there was already that work ethic okay. framework. I assumed that I could raise uh, the money that is needed. I have all this nice five-year projection, and I have all the annual and the quarterly plans to roll up and see things roll out well. 
And I noticed quickly that it didn't work that way. It shouldn't be surprising to notice that, but I had to go through that to learn that. So if you are here trying to start a venture, I say if you have seen a need, do something about it. If you go through the challenges, I just shared with you that you will not be alone. And that is part of entrepreneurship. If you don't fail, you don't learn. I grew through making false projections, false assumptions. I began to ask the right questions. I was so ambitious in one particular occasion, I wanted to supply computers. I didn't raise the question of electricity, yes. reliability. Who is going to fix the computers? Who is going to, yes. you know, someone said, I'll donate the computers. I said, I don't want old computers. He said, I can get you new ones. Said, okay, just hold on. And I began to realize where I wanted the computers to go will end up seeing the computers as liability. Yeah. Yeah. Because suddenly they need to hire all these people. They need to, I need to lobby with government and all that. So those are some of the surprises. I was surprised to discover some of the people we sponsored in different countries, a couple of countries in particular, young women, very, very smart, will be pregnant and get out. And one occasion, top student in high school, just about a year to finish, said, you know what? I don't want to go to high school anymore. My parents have convinced me to go and get married. I'm going. The fact that I'm so passionate about education and I see this talented young lady falling out gave me a setback. But I had to gather myself quickly to assure her that she could be married and she could have children and still get back to finish high school and go on with her life. So those are some of the challenges I face that surprise me. Um, I try to anticipate a lot of my challenges beforehand because um, I grew up in Nigeria, but left at some point, moved around a lot. Um, for me, it was mostly so social and cultural issues. Um, when I when we went to Nigeria in 2015, we had this um, interview on the streets of Lagos, interviewing people on, with this organization called Battlebox and just asking people, asking people about STDs and um, if they've ever gotten tested, and just like talking with people. And I remember one person was, one, one guy stopped me and was like, you're so confident going around talking about STDs, like no man's business. Um, like, you know, being a woman as well too. Um, but when I think about, think back on that right now, one of the projects that we launched out was to provide testing to people for free. Like, we'll give you money, go and get tested. And nobody actually responded to the ad. So we had like an ad, like a competition thing. You can win this amount of money or whatever. And nobody responded to it. And we didn't understand why. Because we're like, we're giving you free money. We're giving you free stuff. Why are you still saying no? And um, over time, we've come to realize that with the stigma surrounding STDs, people don't talk about sexual health in Nigeria. They basically tell, your parents don't talk about sexual health. Depends, some parents do, not all parents do. They don't talk about it in schools. They basically tell you, abstain. If you get pregnant, you're in trouble. So you gotta figure out a way. So you don't talk about anything related to sexual health. You just kind of figure it out on your own. You learn from your friends. And the whole point of educating people is obviously so you don't, you don't get bad advice. So part of that for us mostly has been that there's that stigma of there's certain things we don't talk about in our culture because it's how we do things. And with that stigma, nobody wants to come out and say, oh yeah, I'm gonna claim the free prize of like, you know, go and get tested. Like nobody knows about it. One of the clinics that we partnered with in Nigeria, what they, when we went in to see the clinic, they don't have a sign that says anything related to a clinic or whatever. You come in, you don't even know what it is. It's just a building. And that's because they're sensitive to the culture. They're aware of that. If someone sees you going into a clinic that says sexual health, they will call your mom and be like, oh, I saw your daughter going into this. I wonder what she's up to. So things like that, just being aware of that, it, it makes it very hard for people that want to get tested to get tested. There will, people would actually email and write me details about, oh, I think I have this and whatever. But they don't do that with other people. But we've sort of created that trust. And we've sort of created that, um, presented ourselves as like, no matter what you're gonna say, we're ready for it. Um, so part of being positioned as a referral hub is that they feel comfortable coming to us. But we're still trying to mitigate that cultural and that social aspect of things because a lot of people that should be getting tested are not getting tested. And that contributes to the problem. Um, so money as an incentive doesn't really work. It's still something that we're still trying to figure out because there's also an issue of why would I find out I have HIV when I can't treat it? So it's a lot of factors, but mostly the social and the cultural aspect is what I would say plays um, a major role with the challenges that we had. Okay, can I start?
that? Yeah, please. Okay. So, um, so I know pretty much most, most of us would think that uh, funding is uh, a challenge when you want to start a business or you want to become an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur. But it's true. Um, personally, it was a challenge. But one thing which helped me move forward was to think in terms of how little I need instead of how much I need. Because I realized that at a point, if, I mean, if I look at my business, what I want to do, and I ask myself, how much do I need to run this thing successfully? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear things within me like you need $1 million, you need $2 million, and then, and then it kind of discourages me. I'm like, OK, so where am I going to get all this money from? But I think what, what helped me was I asked myself, how little do I need um, in order to move forward to the next stage? How little? So sometimes you have to ask yourself questions like, how little do you need? Maybe you just need $100 to do something to move you forward. Or you just need something little, like maybe $500 or $1,000. And with this, you can self-fund it, or you can rely on a friend or a family relative to help you raise this capital. And I feel like once you in invest your own money into your business or your venture, it forces you to work hard. It forces you to be on your tools, to get the results that you need. And then gradually, when an investor sees that you'll be able to do this on your own, you'll be able to, I mean, you start this thing with your own funding and you'll be able to do re remarkably well, he is, I mean, he or she is confident to, to, to put money in your venture. Secondly, I think most of us um, pride ourselves in too much Paperwork. Yeah, paperwork, paperwork, everything paperwork, paperwork. Meanwhile, the paper is just here. It's nothing. We, 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 we need to, yeah, yeah, it's true. We, we, need to, we, need to, we need to step inside, you know. We need to dirty ourselves. We need to do the things that will help us move forward. You know, get up, get up, get up and do it. I think, I think that's what worked for me because got to a point, always paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Okay, let me, let me draft or focus how my business will be in the next five years. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we haven't even figured out how to, um, how to sell to um, 10 customers, but then we're figuring out how the, how the business will be in the next five years. It doesn't work that way. Paperwork doesn't work. I, I think <laughs> it's just, yeah, 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 it's just a framework, and we're trying to deceive ourselves if we rely so much on paperwork. We need to, we need to get action, you know? <laughs> We, we, we need to take actionable steps to, to, to make sure that whatever we are thinking, whatever idea we have in our minds, it's, it's, it's becoming a reality. We need to put paper away, I mean paper away, because paper is nothing, it's just a sheet, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and yeah, can I continue? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and at a point, trust me, you're going to get lost. You're really going to get lost. You don't know what, you, you keep asking yourself, so am I doing the right thing? You know, this thing I'm doing, is it going to lead me somewhere, you know, great? I mean, you keep asking yourself these questions. And trust me, it's okay. Whenever you get lost, trust me, you're on the right path. Because all of us get lost. Yeah, even when I was coming, I, I, I got lost. This is my first time in driving this. <laughs> I mean, getting lost is okay. It tells you that you are like you are on the right path. I mean, you feel that that kind of feeling is there. Um, oh my God! So where am I? What, what am I doing? Is it the right thing? And I think one way to overcome this is to speak to mentors. I mean, you should have mentors who kind of mentor you. People who have done what you're doing before, and they, they have the, the kind of requisite knowledge you need to kind of mentor you and guide you. It's very necessary. Very, very necessary. I mean, everybody is good at something that you're probably not good at. So it's good. It's, it's, it's the best thing to do to kind of reach out to people to help you. You know, I'm doing this and this and this. I want to sell to ten customers a day. How do you think I can do it? Feel free to reach out to people. I mean, even the person sitting next to you could be the solution to your to your next business problem. You know, so feel free to reach out to people. But then finally, I want to talk about failure. Can I still continue? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that um, failure is something which has been so overrated. Um, personally, I used to run a competition for startups in Ghana called Startup Cup, where we have people apply and then they um, submit their business models. People come with huge business ideas. I want to be the next uh, Bill Gates and w whatever. And I guess to 
a point where they hit um, a little challenge and they go like, I can't continue this. And I'm like, why can't you continue? Because, because this is what we wanted to do and then we didn't, we didn't achieve it, so I think it's not the right thing for me. But trust me, whenever you fail, whenever you fail, the best thing you can say to yourself is thank you. Do you know why? Because then you have learned something new that nobody can ever teach you. You have learned something that doesn't really work. Like, it, it doesn't work. So it gives you the kind of confidence, let's feel that give you confidence to, to move forward. I think that whenever you fail at something in business, whenever you fail, maybe you set yourself some targets to sell to maybe 500 people and then at the end of the, the, the month, you're able to sell to only 100 people. Let it motivate you, okay? It's okay to fail. Fail as many times as possible. Fail so many times and learn from it. That's the best thing you can ever do to yourself as an entrepreneur. So I, I failed. I failed a number of times. I failed a number of times. Some 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 things I wanted to do, I couldn't do it. I mean, I tried even with mentors, I couldn't do it, and I was tempted to be down, you know, um, worried, discouraged. But then I allowed failure to inspire me because, trust me, if you if you put somebody who has failed hundred times here, and you put somebody who has succeeded at his or her first chance in business. I would always go for the person who has failed. Because then he has confidence, number one. Number two, he has learned what doesn't work. And number three, he is so hungry to, 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 to get some results. You understand? So I, I think these were my, my, my challenges. And I'm happy I, I was able to learn a lot throughout these, these moments. Thanks, yeah. Thank you. Tunde? Um, so my, my challenges starting uh, my company uh, have to do with moving back home. Um, so now I live in Lagos. Um, I was a student in Boston um, until last year. And um, I moved back uh, immediately after, like following a week after graduation. And my first challenge was family. Um, you know how the, the American dream is to be successful here? The Nigerian dream is just to leave the country. Um, so a lot of folks didn't understand why I would want to come back. Why? What are you doing back home? You know. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I said the Nigerian dream was just leave the country. Like oh, yeah. once you leave, you just don't come back. Um, <laughs> so uh, my my family were like, sorry, what? Like seriously, what are you doing here? Um, so that was the first challenge. Even, even when I was coming back here um, on Wednesday, when I was living home on Wednesday. I want to see my mom before heading to the airport. She was like, oh, those are your friends you're going to see. Why are you, why, they staying back, why are you not staying back? Um, but I think she's trying, to, she's trying to understand what I'm trying to do. Um, and the second challenge I think that I face, specifically in my company, has been internet. Um, so we're trying to solve challenges that people face with respect to internet, but we need internet to do it. Uh, so that's been kind of a funny conundrum. Um, we've had to pay for very expensive internet um, to be able to have the kind of um, speeds that we have here. Um, it cost me like four times as much as I used to spend here, um, but it's one of those things that I had to do. Um, the last challenge was traffic. Um, <laughs> in Lagos, it's, it's crazy. Um, and after being back for two weeks, I realized that I just couldn't spend my time in traffic. I couldn't allow um, the employees to also spend so much time in traffic. So we, we had enough money, so we just went to the house, and we all lived there. Um, so, was that my challenge? Thank you. Yeah, um, one of the challenges that we faced was the, what the business people community call the first mover challenge. Oh, you have an advantage because you are the first with a new product on the market or a service on the market. But so it, the context was this. We had this idea about bringing technology to Africa. So we spent our time learning in technology companies in the US and the UK and uh, some, a couple of our partners who also are in Australia. And one of the partners actually worked for Steve Jobs when Steve was working was in the next computer. So he had these lofty ideas, and so we bring, we go to Nairobi, and we think that we'll just be accepted when we arrive there. 
we start knocking on doors of companies and we find it was not possible. We tried to tell them this is what you can do, but it didn't make sense. Uh, every time we go to a corporation, we demonstrate the capabilities of the internet. And next time we hear, they say, okay, why don't you talk to this other company first? The company they would send us to would be a public relations company that they have hired and they have to go back to the public relations company to ask them, does this technology make sense? Should we go with this? And being the early days of the internet, the public relations companies were also afraid they didn't know what the internet was bringing, so they would tell them, keep off your hands of that. So that was a challenge, that a big challenge until we started uh, learning to break through that hustle, uh, hurdle. We had to do a lot of education, free education, bringing videos, movies, examples of how people are using the internet. And then we now decided to go after the public relations companies and taught them how they could use. So we didn't go as we are going with a solution. We are not going to displace them, but we are going to bring them, we are going to show them how they can help these, their, their customers uh, manage their business, businesses better. So that was one hazard. I say there are several other companies. The, the, the most recent one now, this is, my, this is not my own experience, but my experience from my nephew, who just started a horticultural business in Kenya. And these are the hurdles when I asked him about these problems. I told him I was coming to this uh, discussion, and then he told me what he's facing. He, he, pl he, he plants vegetables, flowers, in a greenhouses and then sells them in Nairobi. Sometimes he, he gets to export them. So the challenge he's getting is that when he harvests and he doesn't ship them out, there is no place for refrigeration and whatnot. So there's a lot of wastage. Another challenge he's getting is that the chemicals, the fertilizers they are selling them on the market are contraband. Sometimes you actually find just it's half fertilizer, half sand mixed mm -hmm. up there. Uh, another challenge that is facing is when it comes to pest control, you, they don't know what chemical is going to work, if it's the right one, and so that is a big challenge, the knowing what, 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 what um, the, the right pesticides to use on the, on the, on the, on the plants and so forth. Okay. Hi. Um, I have to go to the Church of Emmanuel, Pastor Emmanuel. <laughs> So th th there were there were a few. I mean, th there was societal, there was educational, there was um, cross-cultural and infrastructural. So on societal, um, one of the first things I had to learn was just that just because you know I have the same pigmentation as my fellow brothers in, in Nigeria doesn't mean that I I would be able to gain their trust. Like if you look on the surface, I'm a Ni Nigerian with a pseudo-American accent. That was already a barrier for me. It was like we don't. You, they ha I had to prove to them that I was Nigerian enough uh, on many levels, and then. When you go there, you also have the cross-cultural elements where outside of Nigeria, you can bond over the fact that you're Nigerian, but in Nigeria, you're Igbo, Awusa, you're about whatever tribe, and that's a priority. <laughs> and so those are the things that you have to do. And I, I you know, um, thinking that I, was, I could just go back and say, hey, we, I'm Nigerian, we want to solve the same thing, was not necessarily the uh, easiest barrier to cross, because uh, that was one of those things. There's on the societal element, there was this issue, this issue of gender bias. Like if you look at a lot of um, um, women, that they're not given priority to education. And a lot of what I was trying to do is to sort of provide that equal opportunity. And so I had to understand that I had to have multiple levels of, of you know, education systems. And I had to understand that just because you have good intentions doesn't mean that that's, how it's, that's, that's how everything you're gonna, you're gonna have to need. You have to be cross-cultural in the sense that you're gonna deal with tribal issues, with stigmas. Um, and then with biases, and how do you, you know, make sure that that's, uh, you're providing access for all those areas. Um, infrastructure, you know, uh, you know um, he, uh, Tunde said it here with, with roads leading to traffic, electricity leading to all that, and making sure that you're thinking of all these things ahead of time. And um, yeah, and, and then the education opportunity for me is whenever you want to build a business in, um, in Africa, as Nigeria especially, you have to make sure one, you anticipate, but you have to make sure you literally create a lot of the, uh, the roadmap because 
there are going to be multiple levels of people you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so don't apply Western sensibilities without um, acknowledging the environment you're in. You know, governments are going to be different. You know, they might give you some grant, they might act differently towards um, with you based on certain things. And so, yeah, so, you know, don't go in there with a one size fits all approach. Be able to be flexible and uh, understand that there, there are multiple levels and layers that uh, dealt with, and that includes expectations from society levels and also, um, you know, uh, things that, you know, you have to really earn trust uh, a lot. So, yeah, that's my thing. I know I'm just trying to be as short as possible, but that's okay. all I could say. Okay. Um, I have one final question for the pa panelists, and then we'll open it up for your questions. And um, Tayo sort of alluded to this, commented about this sort of gender bias, and broadly, which is everywhere. Um, so I'm going to start off asking Dami this question. Um, what specific issues do you feel you f benefited from or were challenged by as a woman social entrepreneur? And I would like to ask all the other male panelists here, uh, what uh, challenges do you think women entrepreneurs in Africa might face or might not face? So. Um. So challenges, I was aware of some of them before I left Nigeria and also growing up in Nigeria. And, um, Nigeria is a very patriarchal society, so usually, let me give you an example. So say, for example, you go to the mall with a guy, um, and let's say the woman is the one that makes the money and whatnot, and she offers to pay for something. Whoever is in charge, it's, it's likely they would thank the man and say, oh, thank you, sir, or whatever. They wouldn't know the woman is the one to actually give the money. So that happens. Um, for me, what, what I'm doing right now in Nigeria is very controversial because it's sexual health. Nobody talks about sex, and I'm talking about sex, and I'm a woman too. Um, so I was already aware of that. First, I already have the shield of social media, like the internet, that helps. I'm not physically talking to anybody right now. But being aware of that, when I'm doing stuff, I have a lot of males around me um, in the sense that um, my family is there, like I have support. Um, in terms of if a guy needs to go somewhere with me, I'm going there with that person. Or um, if I'm liaising with someone, they're already aware that, okay, I am the founder and this is what I need and things like that. Um, so I have that, I would, I would say that the benefit of living there, the benefit of understanding the culture helps me to be prepared as opposed to being shocked about the way someone treats me. So if I'm going ahead of time, I have a team, and I'm very clear about what I want. So far, I haven't really experienced a lot of backlash. Um, I probably would. Um, I'm expecting it. But so far, I haven't. Um, yeah. So, so it's planning ahead. It's planning ahead, just being aware of the culture. And sort of working with cultural. Exactly. And, and women in Nigeria are very strong. African women are strong. You guys have seen Black Panther. That's nothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so African women are very strong and they're very assertive and they know what they want. Um, so it's not uncommon for women to push back. That happens very easily. Um, but I haven't experienced it yet. I don't know what factors may contribute to it. It might be the fact that I'm coming from a Western culture with a Western, I'm bringing a nonprofit from a Western, but that's really frowned upon as well, too. It's not always uh, an advantage. Um, but it's also the fact that I know what I want and I'm going for what I want. And if you want to work with me, if you're going to be benefiting from what I'm bringing, then sure. You're either, with, you're either in or you're not in. So, so you're able to negotiate. I'm able to negotiate, yeah. exactly, even with the males. So, right. yeah, so far nothing. So would anyone else on the panel like to have Oh, you wanted to? No, feel free. No, you're, you're my boss. You're my boss. <laughs> Yeah, I teach cultural intelligence for leaders in, on the continent. I noticed that the challenges women face is not, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, it's not a woman's ability to start something mm -hmm. and run it and do well. They seem to, once they start and they're doing well, they don't have a lot of hiccups on the way. Mm -hmm. Where the challenge seem to arise more is when they are working in mainstream, mm -hmm. either for industry or government, and it comes to promotion and expectations, they are always hesitant to put them at a level that they actually deserve to be there. And North Africa is slightly different in this regard. I do spend a few, perhaps every year, at least once a year, doing something in North Africa. And it's a big challenge for women. Mm -hmm. How you rise, even if you're gonna start something anew, 
how the rest of the society see your rise. If it is not associated with a male figure, it's slightly different. Mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan African women are tough and seem to do well. My own mother was a very successful uh, businesswoman. I think the real challenge they face is the confidence that men may have in them. Support them, give them the resources they need to be able to start and try. They seem to begin from nowhere and mm -hmm. still do very well. Right. And, and I think that is a challenge that if we can overcome, mm -hmm. we, we will be able to make a lot of headway. So helping them scale up as a, and expand. As a, okay. All right, thank you. Um, when it comes to the issue of gender, um, I, I want to talk a bit about women and the fact, the fact that they have this unique power that most of times they kind of feel um, they do not. They don't have. They don't have. If you look at men and women, I mean, men come out of women. Women, I mean, the whole story about giving birth is centered around women. So if you're a woman, if you're a lady, I just feel like telling you today that you are more than powerful. And the reason why I say this is I, I meet so many young, young ladies and they go like, Emmanuel, I have so many problems. I don't think I can do this. Please, young ladies need to start believing themselves. If you, I mean, if, if a woman, I mean, without, without a woman, we can't have, we can't, we can't have babies, right? Without women, we wouldn't have been here today. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So that's en that alone is enough. We, we, I mean, I, I'm not a woman. I mean, women carry a lot of power within that can, I mean, it's so powerful. I, I don't know how to describe this, but I feel like women are so powerful. You need to start believing yourselves. Okay. Your, I mean, your destiny does not lie in anybody's hands or whatever. It's, it's in your hands. So when it comes to gender, gender issues, I always want to encourage young women to start believing themselves and the fact that they can be able to do something that men cannot do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, in, in my experience, uh, especially with the entrepreneurship, it, it comes down to access to opportunity and financing, right? I, I've been in rooms where people, you know, the same thing you said, a man and a woman walk together to assume the guy's leader. But also when you're trying to raise money in the entrepreneur environment, a lot of times, um, you know, a lot of my female friends would express the fact that you know, they, they're wary of a, of a nice gesture because it usually comes with something attached. And this has happened too many times mm -hmm. to a lot of them where, you know, they're like, oh, you came to my event and you supported me. What's next? And at the indications, you know, something sexual, a sexual favor. So there's, there's been that element there. But it's also, when I talk about access, it's also this idea of educating and empowering our young girls to understand that they can be, they can be uh, okoye, Right? They can be members of, of the, you know, Dora Milaje in, in Wakanda. And, and uh, that, that, they're, that they're seen as equal. A lot of people, what is the story is that if you look at a lot of media representations, even in Africa, the people that you, you see at the forefront are men if it's not entertainment. Mm -hmm. People that, if you see a lot of people, pronouns used, it is he versus she. And these are things that are mentally programmed, the things in the, 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 the history book. So that has been my experience. And also, if you go down to the lower income areas, the priority is raised on the sun, right? There are the areas where there was gender mutilation and you know, things like that. So Congo is a good example mm -hmm. of this. So these, there are several areas in Africa where we collectively need to work with that. And the gender issue is a, is a male and female issue. But, um, it has come more to access and really changing narratives around the idea that one gender is inherently superior to one, which is not true. I mean, Emmanuel reminded us where we came from. So, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's been my um, um, experience. It does come down to the old guard versus new guard. People in power tend to have some biases that they can't get rid of, and they tend to say things like, when are you getting married? As opposed to, When's your opportunity? <laughs> or you know, what's the business you're working on? Where's your husband? You know, don't date guys till you're 25, and then 26, where's your husband? You know, it's just like you figure that out in the last 30 seconds. So those type of things. So it's that, that stigma, and I think it comes down to the education and all that. And I think um, 
even this panel here, we were, we were talking about this, this is an African panel. It could have been more females here. <laughs> like these, these are certain things that, these are all things that a lot of us don't take. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is not a slight in anyone. I'm just saying, this is, these are the things that happen and we sort of don't yeah. even acknowledge that yeah. and all that because Africa has just as many females as, as women, as men. Yeah. So uh, these are all these things that we, we yeah. need to address. Yeah, David? just to just support the, the question, the idea of access and the, my experience in Kenya is that uh, if you are going there to start up a business, either for profit or uh, social entrepreneurship, you need to join the clubs that exist on the ground. So they'll be called sports clubs and so forth, and they are very powerful. If you are not there, that's where the decisions are made. Uh, there's a lot of um, licensing required from local government, the national government, and the people make those decisions belong to those clubs. So those, when, when you are there, doors will be opened. You'll find the right person, you talk to them, and your paperwork will be moved mm -hmm. in the office. So that's right. quite important. Tunde, any thoughts? Pardon? No, okay. <laughs> okay, so let's open it up to uh, questions. Um, Hi, thanks. Um, Dr. Bakuli mentioned using WhatsApp to raise funding for um, a kind of, sound like a credit union in Western Africa, in Western Kenya, sorry. Um, I was curious about what the online platforms any of the panel have heard about that are kind of similarly useful for sourcing financing in the, either in the US, Europe, or in Africa. Um, and if you discuss that kind of, what you're seeing technologically in that, to that vein. I'm, I'm Godfrey Bakuli, that's my father, so <laughs> I'm a, a Kenyan-born investor in New York City, uh, visiting Brown for the first time. Thanks. I don't know the name of the software, but in countries like Ghana and Togo, recently I realized that even in the remote area, they do what they call mobile money and they are basically using all these text messages and they can transfer huge sums. And I noticed that mobile money is helping them to reduce the amount of cash they carry and make it quite safe as well. I don't know the name of the software, but the same way they used to also, if you are raising funds, some people could also use mobile money. I've had people ask me whether I would like to buy um, units for their cell phone. We, we buy cell phone units, and I could use mobile money, buy units, whatever the people are, and then have them be able to correspond with me. So that kind of platform is evolving. A lot of exciting things are happening on the continent. I would really urge you guys, contact the Chamber of Commerce, contact the embassies, and explore. That I think there is money to be made, and there are lives to be changed. I'm not, well, I think the, the channels to raise money depend on, depends on the scale. Um, if you want to raise, um, you know, $20, uh, there are very, very simple ways of doing that. Um, so there are um, crowdfunding platforms in almost every country uh, where you can raise more money to get small loans. Um, in Nigeria, there's a company called Pay Later that does that. Um, but for for companies, um, so far in my experience, it's you know traditional um, angel investing um, that most people do. Um, for those who are trying to get um, non-equity money for uh, for the non-profits or uh, for their companies, um, it's just regular grants and budget competitions. Um, a lot of companies that I know in. Nigeria, uh, most social companies that I know do rely on grants to, to get going for the first one or two years. Uh, while they test the market, prove that there's a market, iterate in their product, and they have a bunch of them. Um, when, when we're starting out, um, we've gotten about 250K free. 
Um, and the, the money is just there, right? So, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure of any um, online platforms uh, for stuff, stuff like that. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm David Erbo, um, Brown student. Um, I'm Nigerian. Um, I'm past, um, also, you've been talking about a bunch of different things, and no one touched on real, no one touched on real estate in, um, in Africa as a whole, because I think that's an untapped um, market no one has really, really gone into. Um, so what's your take on that? Like, how do you get investments in real estate because I think that opens a lot of gateway to everyone to um, get better economically and a whole bunch of stuff because we mostly rely on oil and exports and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, I have some experience with that and perhaps it came just by accident. Uh, when I was coming here, a friend, uh, I, I, I sold my, my vehicle. I was coming back to graduate school, sold my, my car, and gave that money to my brother. It was $900 at that time. And then my brother bought a, a plot for me. When I went back later, 1996, after about 10 years, it, had, it was still there. I didn't do anything, and 2006, I told him, what can I do with that plot? So he decided, he told me, oh, I can, if you have some money, I can build for you. So about $5,000, he built uh, some property there. And fast forward, if you come this year, it's valued at uh, not less than, uh, uh, I'm trying to convert into, dollars from <laughs> Kenyan, 10, 10 million Kenyan from 15,000 Kenyan shillings is now 10 million Kenyan shillings worth of that. Uh, so real estate, if you just use a, ni a nice place. The other, another place was, uh, uh, this is 1997, where we bought as a family and uh, outside of the city of Nairobi, but we, we realized that the city was going to grow beyond the, the the current uh, boundaries. And so we went into that area at a very inexpensive, equivalent five, four thousand uh, dollars That's 1997. Uh, the valuation which was done last year is $150,000. So now there are some, there, there's each problems. Uh, maybe I was just lucky, uh, but there are met some other guys who have been lucky and they have uh, told me similar stories. There are other stories too that some who have lost a big deal when we are investing in real estate. So it is something that if you are interested in real estate, I would recommend you don't do it at, uh, at a distance, but go see the land. And I don't know about uh, the land re issue, registration issues in your country, but in Kenya it can be very easy to get um, swindled if you you may think you have a, a title but if you didn't go to the registry and see that title uh, being printed you might be getting a fake one um, uh, I, I think um, real estate is, is interesting um, so for almost anything that uh, any kind of problem that you see in in Africa um, it's right for a solution um, if you can think of something but but I said it's hard um, because of, I think, um, government control. Uh, in Nigeria, the, the Land Use Act, for example, is just crazy. You cannot actually own land. You can only lease it from the government. That makes it hard for you to plan around that. Um, and also, um, capital is hard to come by, right? So if you want to, there's nothing like a mortgage, right? There's no long-term financing. So it's hard to, to you know, finance your home. You know, it costs a lot of money for you, for you to build a home. Um, but the interesting things that people are trying to do, um, one around listing, right? So if someone is looking for a home, what did they find that? Before you'd have to go and find an agent and all those things. Um, now you can go online um, to find properties to buy, properties to rent, 
I mean, there are good examples in Ghana and in Nigeria. Um, the second thing that one particular uh, person, entrepreneur, has done um, is to figure out how to make it easier for people to rent homes. So in the U.S., when you when you guys uh, want to um, when you want to rent a place, you just in the case of interest, you sign a lease and you pay monthly. In Nigeria and in Ghana and in other countries, you have to find money for two years' rent um, upfront. That's a lot of money, right? But because it's low trust, you can't just sign a paper and people will believe you, right? You have to actually show them the money and pay upfront, right? Um, but someone figured out a way to make it possible for you to pay monthly, right? And there's a business a year for entrepreneurship. Um, so there is, um, you know, this company is called Fiber, F I B R E. You should check them out, fiber.com. Um, and I think that the last thing that I know that uh, thirty that people, um, someone is doing, is to figure out how to make land titles easier to get and transfer. Uh, so there's a company in Ghana called uh, Landmap that is doing that. Um, so basically digitizing um, land, uh, land ownership using blockchain and uh, being able to prove that you own it and if you sell it to someone else, they transfer um, the title to you. So, simple. Yeah, I've done some work with a real estate company in Ghana, and I can tell you that there are multiple fronts of challenges, but there are a lot of progress. Uh, if you're able to pair up with a company that has good standing on the ground, you can make a lot of money investing. That is on the corporate side of things. If you are individual, ideally, if you are from that country, you want to find a way to own your own land, start something, and build. The one I would recommend for, as an entrepreneurial venture, is to try to enter into partnership. Partnership is hot in a place like Ghana. You can make significant returns. In a place like Egypt, they are expanding. They are building all kinds of places. They figure out now they can get water because of solar. You can get electricity. You don't have to depend on the Nile alone. And so Cairo is expanding, and it's real estate, real estate, real estate. What I will not recommend for someone putting in big money into real estate is to try to do something on your own or try to do something that is linked to your connection with an African government. Because in my experience with my friends in those industries, change of government could mean you lose everything, especially if the land is not developed. But there is a lot that one can enter into with existing companies on the ground. You can bring your technical know-how, invest, monitor with them, and there are a lot of returns because they build them at cheap cost, they sell them uh, pretty well. Land ownership is always a big issue. Uh, I don't know so much of North Africa, but I know a place like Ghana, you, you know, one land can be sold to five people. And so you, you need to be very careful as you get into that part of investment. Okay. Any other questions? Hi. Oh, hi. My name is Joy Sunday, and I'm a graduate, school here, a graduate student here at Brown. Um, I have a question directed at Dr. Tunde, and he spoke about changing the education system in Nigeria. And I wanted to know that, bearing in mind that um, the Nigerian government is absolutely corrupt, um, have you thought of maybe incorporating your nonprofit with a government institution to make a more a greater impact? Um, and my second question is open for every, to to anyone. Um, so I was thinking that maybe the best way to build a nonprofit, um, maybe thinking about a feedback loop where the people that you're building the nonprofit for are able to raise their voices and you know speak up on issues that you're solving for them, and maybe perhaps the government may listen. Thank you. Um, so to the question about um, incorporating my nonprofit with uh, the government, so we already do that, do not directly with the government. So what we're trying to do, uh, like I mentioned before, is to, um, so we, we take, so I went to MIT, uh, we take the MIT, MIT Center of Education, um, package that in classes and find instructors and go to um, universities in Nigeria to teach. Um, and beyond that, we also work with 
the local lecturers, uh, the professors, to incorporate um, the style of teaching into their classes. So basically, what we want them to do is to not just teach thermodynamics, but teach thermodynamics with um, problem sets that task students to think about how to apply thermodynamics to problems that they see around them, right? Um, how to apply, when you're teaching them um, about osmosis, can they think about how to purify water with that? Um, so stuff like that, right? And, and we've been working, we've right now worked with five universities, um, and uh, the work keeps going. It's it, not, not every university uh, wants to change, and every, not, it's not every time that we find a professor to work with. And when we do, um, we have an ongoing relationship because we think that you know, we, we, we're a team of um, seven people, uh, a couple of volunteers. We don't have all the time in the world to keep going back to teach. Right? But these teachers, these professors, spend all the time with students, uh, many generations of students, so rather just work with them. Um, so so it's, it's, I, don't, I don't think I ever want to work with the government. It's going to be a waste of my time. So we we'll work with universities directly. Could you repeat your second question? Um, my second question goes back to incorporating um, a feedback for profit loop into your nonprofit. Um, maybe like the thousand people that you've reached out to since you're going on to graduate with degrees and get jobs, are you able to pay X amount of money back to the system that helped you get to where you are? Kind of system. OK, um, so if I got your question right, you want to know whether there could be a feedback system where the people you impact yeah. are able to give back, back. Give back or yes. expand? Yes, back to the nonprofit. So you can, it oh. can be self-sustained, too. Oh, OK, OK. So yeah, I think, I, I think it's possible. I think that, um, I mean, everything we do, there, there are so many people who have been impacted. Um, well, let me go back to this competition that I used to organize. We had um, people win. I mean, we're able to sponsor people to travel abroad to participate in a regional competition. We're able to seek or I mean, search for funding for most of these companies. Some acquired like twenty-five thousand dollars grants, you know, hundred thousand dollars grants and stuff like that. And we don't get anything. But at the end of the day, the way that they the, the payback to us is to come back and then nurture those who are yet to you know go or undergo this this competition, nurture them, teach them um, what they have to do in order to be able to raise funding, what they have to do in order to be able to you know move their business forward. So I think that I mean getting the feedback for every nonprofit is a priority. I think that most nonprofits already have that because there's no way they're they're gonna leave you to go like that. I, I'm a proud alumni of Junior Achievement. And so, I mean, I, I, I kind of like talk about Junior Achievement every single day because of the kind of impact I mean, Junior Achievement had on me. Kind of the fact that they discovered me, my talents, what I was, what I'm doing now, I wouldn't have been able to do it if I had not participated in the Junior Achievement program. So, there, I mean, most, most, or let me say the serious ones, always make use of the alumni, the people that they impacted so they can be able to tell a success story. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's it's already exists. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we started about ten minutes late, so we'll take one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this was a great panel. I came in late. I came from work, but um, my name is Stephanie. I'm a young professional Ghanaian descent, first generation. Um, so it was good to hear about the progress in Ghana. Um, I'm also a member of AARI, um, the Young Adults Group. Just to put a plug, we have a Jalof, our first annual Jalof cook-off cook on the 28th. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, said the infamous words. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that for the contest, so. Um, but yeah, in terms of that, you can um, 
um, see me or a fine board member or my two members here in the back to learn more about the event. Um, so two questions I have is, it's, it's known that it's, I guess I'll just, I'll just put the elephant in the room, but it's hard for Africans to work together. And so I heard a lot of positive things in terms of black, the Black Panther references. So twofold, one is that do you see or foresee um, now, especially like Black Panther coming out, um, that came out, um, Africans working together. And then the second part of it is African Americans here in the United States putting investments towards like your different ventures. Like for example, um, Akon doing the water wells, for example, like French Montana had, he had his song last year. So, you know, given, I'm just giving an example of some celebrities. Thanks for that question. I'm really excited about it. And I'm answering it because I have to jet out back to New York as soon as I answer this question. So I wanted to give that opportunity to the uh, rest of the panel before I do. Um, the, what I've noticed the Black Panther thing, I saw it four times, um, <laughs> it is a lot of people, a lot of Africans in diaspora and Africans, African Americans have gotten more curious about the heritage. We've gotten more curious about the idea of a possible Wakanda and the idea of what a world could look like in an Afro-future type way. So I do think it has gotten people more used to the idea of, hey, we are, you know, we share a pigmentation, we share a cultural heritage. So I've seen a lot of positive movement towards that. But the most exciting thing I've seen about that is the interest and the curiosity that's been piqued because what the movie did was picked different parts of Africa and, you know, different tribes, the different things, basically to pick something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do think, I do see a movement, especially with the millennial generation and Gen Z generation, understanding that globalization gives us more, more access to that type of thing that it does help. There's also a book called Children of Blood and Bone by Tony Adeyemi. Um, read that book, bestseller, she got a seven-figure deal out of that. But that's based on Western, uh, you, know, um, you know, mythology and in the, in the Yoruba tribe as well, which is... Uh, where I, my, my tribe and I identify with. So I see a lot of things happening more in the media and the representation side, but what happens with media representation is that you see yourself in that. Um, and I think that's a positive influence. Thank you all for having me. It's been a pleasure. I hope to come back to Brown, and thank you so much. <laughs>